morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. I'm Michael Bolden with the Tenth Amendment Center, and this is the show for Monday, May 2nd, 2022. And on this episode, I'm talking about a foundational pillar of the Constitution, that is the separation of powers. James Madison thought it was so important that he actually wanted to include it as an amendment with the Bill of Rights. And technically, he actually wanted to make it a partner to what became the Tenth Amendment as a new Article 7 of the Constitution, separation of powers and federalism hand in hand. So today I'm going to share a little history behind the principle. I've got James Madison's views, some opposition to uh, the Constitution without this type of an amendment, and then the fact that it actually passed, it sailed through with the Bill of Rights in the House, but it failed in the Senate. So I've got four reasons why that possibly happened. We don't know for sure because the debates were secret. Anyways, first of all, before getting to that, I want to say a quick hello to everyone out in the live chat. I really appreciate you spending some time with me for a few minutes today, whether this is your first episode or you've been here for every single one since day one. But while we allow people another minute or so to get notifications, uh, hello to Dixie Strong in Alabama, Cheriton Farmer in Missouri, Lisa, 67 Believe, Run Level 1, finally didn't have a meeting overlap, awesome, good to see you, Clay Kent, Lawrence Smith in West Virginia, Gun Eye in Missouri, Murray Ray in Michigan, Brian in Georgia, Haji in Michigan, Tim Martin in Arizona, I appreciate your email that you sent, uh, Hunter's over on Twitch, I love it when you're over on Twitch, it's actually one of my favorite platforms for the mainstream ones, uh, Samuel Adams for an uproarious time, thank you all for being here, but let's get right to this. First of all, I want to start out, oh, Matthew over in Louisiana, while well, I still see that up on my screen. Anyways, let's get right to it. I want to start out with a, a book, an introduction to the separation of powers from the book, The Founder's Constitution, which is published and available for free uh, from the Liberty, of Fu Liberty Fund and the University of Chicago Press. I will link to it in the show notes, 10 amendmentcentercom slash path to liberty. And here's how they put it. Of the doctrine of the separation of powers... So familiar to readers of Supreme Court opinions, the Constitution says not a word. It's not actually in the Constitution specifically, expressly in, its, in, in the text. Yet the framework of government outlined in the Constitution of 1787 presupposes the separation of powers, gives expression to it, and in so doing further refines the meaning of the doctrine. Much of the controversy over drafting and ratification turned on this question of meeting. We had a concern from one side that there was going to be consolidation, centralization, combining the departments into one. And then the other side saying, well, this actually doesn't count as mixing or centralization or consolidation of all the power. So that was the debate. So much of the debate turned on this meaning. At issue, they write, was not whether the proposed Constitution embodies the separation of powers to some extent. Few actually denied that, but whether the separation was adequate. Now, for a history behind where we get separation of powers, you can go way, way back in history. But for the founding generation, you have to look to the British, the English tradition. And, and for that, you kind of go back to 1648. You get a little bit of it. And then you get John Locke's second treatise, which was in uh, 1698 or so, maybe 1700, somewhere around there. Uh, John Locke had some separation of powers. But really, it was, as Madison called him, the celebrated Montesquieu, the spirit of the laws in 1748 that the founders were most influenced by, almost totally. And here, actually, an interesting overview over at Wiki. I don't like to cite them all the time, but uh, this is good uh, a good overview. And they say the term the tripartite system is commonly ascribed to French Enlightenment political philosopher Baron de Montesquieu. I'm sure I'm saying it wrong, although he did not use such a term but referred to them as a distribution of powers. Again, it's the spirit of the laws is the book that all the founders read. They were very well versed in. Montesquieu described the various forms of distribution of political power among a legislature, an executive, and a judiciary. So they had to be separate. We'll get to that in just a moment. He based the model for this on the Constitution of the Roman Republic. You got a little bit of that. And the British unwritten constitutional system. Of course, that was not fully written. So Montesquieu actually argues that each power should only be exercised in its own area, 
And each power should only exercise their own specific functions. And he was quite explicit about this. And he said, and I've got up on the screen a paraphrase, but he said specifically, when the legislative and executive powers are united in the same person or in the same body of magistrates, there can be no liberty. He didn't say there might be some or it might be bad, but if you combine those powers into a single person or a group of people, it could be a cabal, it could even be a legislature, it could be a popularly elected legislature, you still have zero liberty in that scenario. Now, you may be able to get away with stuff. Maybe government will be nice to you for a while and allow you to do stuff, but that's not actually true liberty. But going further, it's not just legislative and executive, and that's really where Locke was. Goes even further, he says, again, there can be, there is no liberty if the judiciary power be not separated from the legislative and executive. And we can see how that plays out in the general discussion about the checks and balances of the Constitution. You have the legislative, the executive, and the judicial. Now back to the Founders' Constitution. They say this way, Although Montesquieu separated governmental functions and separated governmental powers, there is no one clear one-to-one -one correspondence between the two because he did not insist on an absolute separation. And that's actually James Madison's view. There are others, the Anti-Federalists, some of them, uh, Sentinel, which I'll cite in just a little bit, but Madison responds to that. There is some debate. Some people on one side thought, well, he didn't insist on a total separation. You could have some mixture. And others were saying, no, no, it has to be totally separated. Thus, although the executive is a separate branch, they write, it pro properly partakes through the veto, for example, in a legislative function. So even that is a partially mixed situation because if the legislature was supreme on legislation and the executive was supreme or exclusive just on ex executing the laws, then the legislature would make the law and tell the, the executive what to do. There would be no veto, none of that stuff. Uh, so that is a mixture of the power in just a little, and I'll get back to that in just a little bit. So this was so influential on the founders and the old revolutionaries that during the uh, the time of the revolution, the war with Britain, of course, there were a number of state constitutions drafted. John Adams, for example, drafted the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780. I think it is one of the three oldest still operating constitutions in the world. I think so. Something like that. But in the Declaration of Rights, he actually includes this uh, structure, this separation of power structure. It was in the Bill of Rights for the Massachusetts Constitution. The next article, part the second, was the frame of government. You would think separation of powers or delegated and reserve powers would be under the structure of government, but they actually considered this the rights of the people to ensure that their uh, elected or delegated representatives, agents in government, did not mix their powers. So he included this in the, the Declaration of Rights. And I think the language was really, a lot it came from, of course, from Montesquieu and understanding this, the warning that when you combine them, combine these powers, you have no liberty. That's, of course, Adams would have been a great student of that. But he also had personal experience with this in Massachusetts. Uh, people like Thomas Hutchinson, he basically, I mean, when you get down to it, if you look at the history, he was like, instead of collecting player cards or uh, other trinkets or coins or whatever it may be at the time, he was basically collecting high offices in the government in various branches, even though he was already in a very powerful office. So John Adams recognized that this really created a serious problem. Let me read it. Article 30. In the government of this commonwealth, the legislative department shall never exercise the executive and judicial powers or either of them. The executive shall never exercise the legislative and judicial powers, or either of them. The judicial shall never exercise the legislative and executive powers, or either of them. To the end, it may be a government of laws and not of men. So that is how John Adams drafted it for the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780. And he was actually concerned, even though he was a Federalist, we see him as more of the big government side of things. He was better before the Revolution than he was when he got in power. He's a great example of how power corrupts. And power always grows, but he was actually very concerned, and I will talk about this later, about the lack of separation of powers in the Senate uh, under the proposed Constitution and how we ended up getting it. And here, uh, George Mason's Constitution of Virginia in 1776, this is literally the very beginning, the start of the document. It says, we, the delegates, blah, 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 say that this is going to be the future form of government. He says, the legislative, executive, and judiciary department shall be separate and distinct 
so that neither exercise the powers properly belonging to the other, nor shall any person exercise the powers of more than one of them at the same time, except that the justices of the county court shall be eligible to either house of assembly. So James Madison obviously drew on that. He liked his own Constitution of Virginia. He was probably good friends, at least for a while, with George Mason. They were, well, I don't know. I'm just assuming at that point someone else, some other historian would probably know much better than I, an actual historian. Uh, that I am not. Anyways, James Madison, Federalist number 47. This is how he described it. He carried this forward. This is the argument, the Federalist Papers. We know Federalists and Anti-Federalists are terms of art. They're terms of propaganda. The Anti-Federalists looked at themselves as supporting real federalism. Uh, and the Federalist Papers themselves did not have, have much of an impact on ratification outside of the state of New York. Uh, James Wilson's State House Yard speech was far more influential on the Federalist side on ratification on the people's understanding. But because James Madison is the guy who was trying to introduce separation of powers into the Constitution, his views in Federalist number 47, he goes all the way from 47 to 51, maybe 52, talking about this topic, are very important. They actually shine a, a lot of light on how he views things. And he just basically repeats what Montesquieu had to say. He said the accumulation of of all the powers, if the accumulation of all powers, legislative, executive, and judiciary in the same hands, whether of one, a few, or many, and whether hereditary, self-appointed, or elective, may justly be pronounced the very definition of tyranny. So to James Madison, putting all those powers into one hand, one single person, one group of people, whether they're elected, whether it's hereditary, it doesn't matter. That is how they describe tyranny. Now, tyranny isn't a situation where you have a despot ruling a country and actually you could have someone forcing liberty on everybody. And Madison would still consider this tyranny because the power you give someone to do something good today You've also given them the power to do the exact opposite. You, the issue is how much power in how many hands, not whether they're doing a good job with that power or not. And everybody seems to get that. Well, not everybody. You guys don't. But a lot of people get that wrong today. So Madison is basically repeating what Montesquieu. He does get some clarification uh, in a future. In, uh, actually, it might even be in 47 here, Federalist 47. But there's some response from the fe anti-Federalist side. And here from the Bill of Rights Institute, they say, during the ratification debates, some critics charge that upon close inspection, the separation of powers in Articles 1 through 3 of the Constitution were not as complete as Montesquieu appeared to advocate and would tend toward an accumulation of power in one branch or another over time. So they expected a consolidation. If you listen to my episodes or you've read any anti-Federalist papers, I did episodes covering all the uh, papers of Brutus and Cato. Brutus specifically talked quite a bit about consolidation. Patrick Henry, we know, warned against consolidation in his first speech in the Virginia Ratifying Convention. He said, oh, this looks like a consolidated government. And he'll say that over and over and over. And he said consolidation must end in the destruction of our liberties. He's just repeating. He's not introducing something new. This is what everybody agreed upon. They agreed that Montesquieu was right, that when you combine these powers, when you consolidate them, you will have a destruction of liberty. The debate was OK, did Montesquieu mean A or B? And we always get into that kind of stuff because we're having those types of debates sometimes today. Oh, what did the founders really mean by this clause and that? And that's that's another discussion. Anyways, so there was quite a bit of debate. Patrick Henry was uh, concerned about consolidation. Richard Henry Lee specifically said his great concern was that it would tend towards consolidation. This would be over time. I covered a lot of this. Uh, one episode that I wanted to point out that I think you guys will find interesting in relation to this one is my episode on Brutus's second anti-federalist paper, Consolidation versus Natural Liberty. I will link to that in the show notes. Uh, but let's look over what at what Sentinel had to say. October 24th, 1787. This is his second anti-federalist paper. He's repeating this common maxim. This mixture of the legislative and executive, moreover, highly tends to corruption. The chief improvement in government in modern times, at least for them, has been the complete separation of the great distinctions of power. So when he's looking, when a lot of the anti-federalists were looking, and I think Bill of Rights Institute is actually incorrect on this, uh, they, people, some people were actually saying, no, 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 
this is a you have to have a complete distinction between these powers. The Federalists and some of the Anti-Federalists are saying you could have some mixture and it was either a debate over, well, did you mix them too much or too little? Would it lead to consolidation or not? And James Madison, this is Federalist 47 from my notes, he actually responds to this view. And he says Montesquieu did not mean that he actually repeats Montesquieu in Fed 47. And then he says he did not mean that these departments ought to have no partial agency in or no control over the acts of each other. His meaning, from his own words, where the whole power of one department is exercised by the same hands, which possess the whole power of another department, the fundamental principles of a free constitution are subverted. Well, liberty is destroyed. Madison is actually understating what he was saying here, but I'm not sure. So this is a difference of opinion and how they're interpreting it in context. Madison would be a better expert on this than me, and so would Sentinel. Whoever wrote Sentinel, the Anti-Federalist Papers, would be a better, better student of this than I. But what I can do is tell you that there were two different views of how to interpret this. Some people thought you had to have a complete separation. Madison and the Federalists thought you could have some mixture. Here from Phoenix Dalto. This is one of my favorite articles over at All Things Liberty, the Journal of the American Revolution, so far this year. And he points out that a lot of the state ratifying conventions actually said, we're not going to ratify unless you include an amendment expressly listing separation of powers just like kind of like what they did in the Massachusetts or Virginia state constitutions. And he writes, of the nine states that proposed amendments alongside their ratification of the Constitution, four, Pennsylvania, Virginia, Rhode Island, North Carolina, included an amendment explicitly stating that the three branches of the federal government must operate and exercise their individual powers separately and distinctly. I actually haven't verified that. I'm surprised to see Pennsylvania in that list. Maybe I'm just missing something, but I'm not surprised to see Virginia, Rhode Island, and North Carolina. Maybe there is something from Massachusetts or New York, but he says specifically a similar amendment was debated in New York and supported by a minority of delegates. These state conventions held the concept of the separation of powers in high regard and believed its inclusion in the Constitution as more than an implicit structural framework to be a necessity. So they didn't want it just to be implied. And once Madison was on board, and he actually was originally opposed with many of the other Federalists like Wilson and Hamilton and others, they thought that adding a Bill of Rights would be dangerous because it would make it confusing. Uh, Madison then was convinced, like, okay, this is what we got to do. And on top of it, we promised them that because it wasn't a binding agreement when they said, we're going to ratify if you include these amendments, we have to follow through. Samuel Adams was getting pretty itchy about this uh, when before, you know, there was some time where that first Congress was going and they weren't doing it. They were delaying. A lot of people were resisting, even including amendments. Samuel Adams was writing to Elbridge Jerry and Richard Henry Lee saying, we got to do this. He put his reputation on the line because Massachusetts was going to vote no. And if Massachusetts voted no, we probably were going to get a no from Virginia. It would have been done. So uh, they had to do this. And James Madison included this type of amendment, the separation of powers in his proposal for the Bill of Rights. Now, before I get to that, and I will read that in just a moment, I should mention that if you want to actually, I keep pointing out, I'll include this in the show notes. I will mention one more time. You can find all the episodes, all the archives, and I publish an individual blog post for every single episode one to two hours after the live stream is done over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. And in the, the show link section, I include stuff that I'm mentioning. I'm including articles or books or other uh, original source documents that I cite or I read quotes from. You can find all the different platforms we're on. We live stream on the mainstream ones, Twitter and Twitch and Facebook and uh, what's the other one? YouTube, right? And we're also on DLive and Odyssey.com. We archive the video all over the place. We have the podcast edition. I'm so grateful for all the reviews coming in on Apple Podcasts. And you can even find our membership program where you can put your financial faith behind our work for as little as two bucks a month. Again, the show homepage is 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. Anyways, let's get back to, to Phoenix Dalto over at allthingsliberty.com. He said, Madison presented 17 amendments composing his Bill of Rights to the House of Representatives on June 8th, 1789. Over the course of the next two months, he received opposition on many of them. A lot of people were saying, okay, it was the same argument again. 
Why do we need to do this? This is dangerous. This is bad. But Madison really pushed through. And what I think he was probably convinced, but I think he was actually following through also on a principle that they agreed to do this. And if they didn't follow through, there were going to be some problems. There were already some issues going on in Massachusetts, for example. So over the course of the next two months, he received opposition on many, some of, with some of his fellow representatives, even questioning whether the Constitution should be changed at all. But Madison persevered, Phoenix writes, and on August 24th, his amendments made it through the gauntlet with all 17 receiving the two thirds vote needed to be passed along to the Senate. So two thirds vote. They all all of them passed through the opposition. There were plenty of debate going on and they still got through. And Phoenix points out something really interesting here. And I didn't know this before. Uh, He said of all his amendments, the 16th was arguably met with the least resistance being carried without altering a single word or triggering extensive debate. And I haven't read the debates over this, so I guess I'm going to trust his research on this from the comments from a bunch of other people uh, uh, reading. They say, you know, good work. And I saw some professors and uh, historians that I recognize their names, and they thought this was actually well done as well. So I find that really interesting that of all the amendments, of all these 17 amendments that Madison wanted, at least the House of Representatives thought the 16th was just autopilot. That was going to be there for sure. And what was the text of the 16th? Here we can see it. The powers delegated by the Constitution to the government of the United States shall be exercised as therein appropriated, so that the legislative shall never exercise the powers vested in the executive or judicial, nor the executive the powers vested vest in the legislative or judicial, nor the judicial the powers vest in the legislative or executive. And again, this was going to be, it was actually going to be included as Article 7 of the Constitution. But let me read a little bit further. He said, for all intents and purposes, this is Phoenix's article, for all intents and purposes, it seemed that the clause was in the clear and would sail through the Senate as it had the House, because basically there was a lot of pressure from the opposition for ratification in the first place ratification of the Constitution in the first place to say we've got to have a Bill of Rights. And then a lot of that pressure surrounded around, and I think the Tenth Amendment, what became the Tenth, may be even more important uh, in this type of process. Maybe that's why it was included. But these were ones that were repeated over and over and over in ratification debates and even in ratification documents. These are the things we want to see in in the Constitution. Phoenix continues, he says, since the debates of the first Senate were kept private, what a surprise. This exclusion, why they voted it down in the Senate, must be explained through a careful synthesis of political arguments and conversations going on elsewhere at the time. There are four explanations for the defeat of this amendment, Madison's amendment, each working in tandem to oppose it. I'm going to give you a hint. My, The one that I think is the case is the last one. I'll go through these relatively quickly. Reason number one, A lot of people thought this was redundant because this was already the structure of the Constitution. But the same could be said about the Ninth and the Tenth Amendment, basically the entire Bill of Rights. The notion that James Wilson actually got out there, this was in his State House Yard speech that everyone on the Federalist side really followed, was that, well, the Constitution is a document of delegated and reserved powers. So if it doesn't say anything about the power over the right to keep and bear arms or the right to self-defense, then it doesn't have that power. And including an amendment on it is considered redundant. So this was one of the arguments that they made on separation of powers, but yet they approved a lot of these other ones. Anyways, the first and most simple reason he writes that this explicit statement of the separation of powers was not added to the Constitution was that it was viewed by some as redundant and unnecessary. The careful enumeration of the powers delegated to each of the three branches made it impossible for one to take on or control the powers of another. Well, that has not been impossible. That was the argument. This was the argument expressed by Roger Sherman of Connecticut when he stated that the amendment was, quote, altogether unnecessary inasmuch as the Constitution assigned the business of each branch of the government to a separate department. So basically, it's like a parchment barrier. And James Madison actually discussed this in that series of Federalist Papers from 47 to 51. In 48, he talked about how, like, just having words on paper is not enough to prevent the departments from encroaching upon each other and consolidating. He acknowledged this. He knew this. And he knew a separation of powers 
was essential. But the argument against, we can say possibly, we don't know for sure because we don't have a record other than things like this, but uh, it probably that why, what's the point of including this? So some powerful people, some well-known people, highly respected people, people like Sherman, who weren't purely Federalist or purely anti-Federalist, were uh, against it for that reason. Then the second reason is that there might be just kind of a formatting issue. And this is, a lot of people don't know this, but when Madison originally drafted his Bill of Rights, this is from Phoenix again, it had not been decided how amendments would become part of the Constitution. As a result, so we see it as the text of the Constitution, and then the Bill of Rights is its own separate thing attached. Now, when Madison actually drafted the Bill of Rights, he actually expected each article or each clause to be inserted specifically into the body of the text, not appended to the end. And so there were some structural ways of how they approached that. As a result, Phoenix writes, Madison wrote his proposal with the assumption that any alterations or additions that he suggested would be directly fit into the existing text. And under the scheme, we had two big changes then. First, he said the clause would appear directly preceding and as part of the same section as the sentence that would eventually become the Tenth Amendment. So we have separation of powers and federalism, delegated and reserved powers to the to the states or to the people, this would have been together alone as a new Article 7. So Article 7 of the Constitution would have been that. Article 7 would have moved to Article 8. He said these two clauses would not be added to an existing article. Instead, they would become a new one. And that was a big one. So some people were just saying, OK, well, we don't really want to have all this structural stuff in the Bill of Rights. We want to just have other stuff. And let me go a little further on this. A third reason that the 16th of Madison's 16th Amendment did not make the cut is its focus on the structure of the government. And these two are very similar. But basically, like if you look at John Adams's Constitution for Massachusetts of 1780, the idea that this is a structural thing, well, even Adams was saying this is part of a Bill of Rights. This wasn't the structure of the government to say that powers had to be separated. So I'm not sure if number three is right as well, but maybe if you combine for each of these uh, arguments, you lose a couple of votes and then you don't you don't get it through and it doesn't go to ratification. So 10 out of the 12 amendments sent to the state conventions for ratification revolved around the rights of the states or of the people. But we can make the case that separation of powers is about the rights of the states and the people, because when they do stuff that the people and the states never delegated to them, they are violating that final authority, their sovereignty. Of these 12 Phoenix rights, the 10 that were successfully ratified to form the Bill of Rights were all aimed at preserving and protecting rights from potential overreach of the federal government. And I could make the case that violating separation of powers is overreach from one branch or all the branches of the federal government that go along with it. And we see this all around us all the time today. And I think, again, like I said right off the bat, I think number four is really the primary reason. It's politics. And this is how Phoenix put it. A fourth and final explanation for the Senate's failure to produce an amendment outlining the separation of powers can be drawn from discussions and criticisms of the Senate itself. So the Senate is looking at an amendment to send to the states to actually basically attack the prestige and power of the Senate. So it's very possible that politicians at the time of the founding were like, oh, I'm not cool with that. I mean, they weren't perfect people, not even close. Here's John Adams in a letter to Cotton Tufts, January of 1788. And here's how he put it, talking about the power of the Constitution. He says, I am mortified. I am mortified at the mixture of legislative and executive powers in the Senate and wish for some other amendments. If even John Adams, who Mercy Otis Warren some years later thought went from revolutionary, the Atlas of Independence, to a monarchist, a guy who liked consolidation of power, if even John Adams was saying, and maybe he was still more of a, a, a guy, a pure federalist at this time, but here in 1788, he's looking at the proposed Constitution, the Constitution that's being debated, especially in Massachusetts at that time, in January 1788, and he considered it, he was mortified at the power of the Senate. And we don't have to get into that specifically. If you guys are really interested, I will cover that uh, in another episode some other time. Some concerns about the power, the mixture of powers in the Senate, 
primarily that's an anti-federalist argument, but I thought it was really interesting to learn. I just learned this from Phoenix's article that Adams was opposed to it as well. And James Madison himself actually had very similar concerns. But there were also Melanchthon Smith, James Monroe, Brutus, of course, the anti-federalist. James Madison, it's a kind of a long, I don't have any specific quotes that I want to highlight from this, but in a letter to Edmund Pendleton in June of 1789, he was also concerned about the mixture of legislative and executive in the Senate itself. And he had a very long letter that I will include in the show notes, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. And here again from on reason number four. Seeing that this critique, this is from Phoenix again, seeing that this critique had often accompanied the call for an amendment like Madison's 16th, the Senate's negative vote may have been motivated by self-preservation. I mean, to me, that just seems, and maybe I have a confirmation bias on this, but I tend to think, yeah, that's probably it. Like, this is something attacking your power and prestige. Not really attacking, but politicians will look at it like that, limiting your power, making sure you have less power. Not a lot of people are willing to vote to restrict their own power. Members of the Senate, he writes, may have been concerned that the passage of such an amendment would pave the way for others that would specifically target the powers of the upper house. Well, I hope you guys found this interesting. I hope it was educational. Of course, again, uh, you can help support the show by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts. You can uh, smash the like button on any of the video platforms. Leaving comments in the archive helps out a ton. And of course, our membership program, nothing helps us reach and teach more people about the Constitution and liberty and how to defend them. More importantly, how to defend both when government refuses to do so, which is every second, 24 hours a day, constantly. Nothing helps us do that work more than the financial faith and support of our members. Our membership program starts out as just two bucks a month. Please don't feel obligated to join us, but if you've got a couple of bucks you can throw our way, I'd be very grateful for any support you can give us. You can do that over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. Uh, I really appreciate you spending some time with me. Let me take a look over in the chat and see if I've got any interesting questions. Lots of thank yous. That is awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, Run level one. I 1788. I am mortified at the mixture of legislative and executive powers. But today the Senate says, hold my beer. That's a good one. Uh, taking a look a little further. The Bill of Rights became a Bill of Mights and the Declaration of Independence has been buried. Well, that's pretty true, Haji. Ryan Lopez says, uh, Ryan, let's rewrite the Constitution. I'm not smart enough to do that. But what I know, do know that it doesn't matter as much what you have on paper if the people don't believe in liberty and the people are unwilling to take a stand when government violates whatever restrictions you give them then you're going to end up with the same problem in the long run. John Dickinson, the penman of the revolution, in his Fabius Letters of 1788 supporting ratification, and he's the guy who's the primary drafter of the Articles of Confederation, and he was on board, and he was like, look, a good constitution promotes but doesn't guarantee a good government, and a good administration doesn't always come from good constitution, vice versa. So you don't always have it. It really gets down to people being willing to take a stand. And unfortunately, we've got a huge problem on our hand because we are literally surrounded by people who hate liberty left and right on various different issues, who think that government is the solution to our problems. And we've got a huge educational uh task ahead of us. So that, I think, is an interesting point. I don't have any interest in rewriting it. Uh, I just have more of an interest in teaching people the value and the importance of liberty. As Samuel Adams put it in 1771, all might be free if they valued freedom and defended it as they ought. So whether you had a constitution or not, if the people believe in liberty and take a stand over the government who violates it, then government can go nowhere. Anyways, uh, I'll look over at some other questions. Oh, Haji says, you can cons do consistently excellent work. Thank you for another informative and interesting episode of Path to Liberty. I really, really appreciate that so much, Haji. Thank you so much. Devil Dog is right. Government is the problem. Well, I also say government is a reflection of the society as a whole. I think the biggest problem we have is that our neighbors all around us are not they don't know anything about the constitution the structure of government they just think that constitutional means good or stuff that i support and so therefore whatever their team is doing is okay and whatever the opposing team is doing is bad so we have a problem of faction first 
party first and then principle last. And we have to switch over to principle over party. I know Ryan Lopez is really good on that for sure. I appreciate your feedback, both of you. Well, actually, all of you. Thank you so much. Anyways, I'm rambling at this point. I'm very grateful for you spending some of your time with me today. I hope you enjoyed the episode. I hope you learned something. And I'll see you next time here on the Path to Liberty.